fresh meat. Orphanages are creepy. That's just a fact. I mean, they made a whole movie about it for a reason. But this isn't your average orphanage. Oh no. See, they're hiding a crap ton of gold, which also means they're getting bombed by people that want that gold. And that's not even getting into the ghost that haunts this place. That's right, a creepy ghost. Today we're diving into an early film of a future Oscar winner with the Devil's Backbone. Before he was an Academy Award winning director, Guillermo del Toro was just a young boy with dreams of becoming a filmmaker. After making his debut feature Kronos, he had the chance to head to Hollywood and work on a studio movie with Miramax's Mimic. He's claimed this was the worst time of his life. The Weinstein brothers kept saying they hated just about everything he shot, and he was almost fired. Yes! Luckily for him, Quentin Tarantino came to the rescue, but the damage had already been done. With this experience, he found that he may never want to work in Hollywood again. Instead, he retreated back to Mexico and started to work on a story he'd written back in college. The film The Devil's Backbone would renew his love of cinema, while also giving him another chance to work his way back into the mainstream. The film terrified audiences and quickly made Del Toro a sought-after name in the horror genre. So what exactly is the story of The Devil's Backbone? I'd like to thank you guys for watching Best Foreign Horror, and ask that if you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now. Like this video and click on the bell so you can be notified each time a new video goes up. And now, back to the show. First, we are introduced to Carlos as he's dropped off at a boy's orphanage during the Spanish Civil War. Nothing like a creepy place in the middle of the desert that holds children, but I digress. In the middle of the courtyard sits an unexploded bomb that had been dropped on the property. It embedded itself in the ground, but didn't detonate. They say it's been diffused, but it's too heavy to take away. Now it's more of a decoration than anything else. Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and say that that's something that should not be at an orphanage. Carlos starts to be bullied by some of the other boys. One night while sneaking out of his room, he runs into a ghost that the other boys call the one who sighs. He begins to try to figure out who this boy is and what happened to him. The ghost, Santi, gives him a warning that many of the boys will end up dying. Because ghosts just never have good news, do they? Meanwhile, the teachers and caretakers at the orphanage begin to worry that the war will find its way to their doorstep. Some of the children there are from families that died fighting against General Franco. They hope that the army doesn't find out about the orphanage, where they might come to wipe out the children that were left behind and those that are caring for them. In the middle of all this is Jacinto, an adult who used to be part of the orphanage before coming of age and leaving. He's returned to the orphanage with bad intentions and now hopes to steal a collection of gold bars that have been hidden there. As the tension mounts, we learn that he may have more to do with the disappearance of the child Santee than he let on. The actor Eduardo Noriega said that Del Toro actually gave him a biography of the character. He had suffered a lot as a child at this orphanage. Someone had treated him horribly and now he's taken out on the boys now that he has grown up and returned to the orphanage. The biography consisted of what his parents did, how he ended up at the orphanage, and what happens to him there. None of this was shown in the film, but it was used to help the actor understand his character and their motivations. When it's discovered what Jacinto's real intentions are, he's forced out of the orphanage. The caretakers round up the children with the intention of leaving before they are discovered by the advancing army, but Jacinto has returned to burn the place to the ground. Children and some of the caretakers die in an explosion. As they pull themselves together with an impending threat descending upon the orphanage, secrets that had long been buried are revealed, and then they have to fight for their lives. One of the great things that Del Toro has done with The Devil's Backbone is to show us a ghost story where you end up feeling sympathy for the ghost. While the situation is scary, we quickly learn that Santi is just as much of a victim as all the other main characters are. He doesn't wish to harm those that share the orphanage with him. His only goal is to get revenge on the person who killed him. With current films like The Conjuring series or other haunting-related stories, we find the spirits to be adversaries. Here, though, the ghost is not looking to harm any innocent residents, only to right the wrong that was done to him. The presence of Santi is visually both scary and beautiful. Santi has a broken skull and blood continuously flows out of it. The look of it, though, evokes a beautiful wonder. Instead of flowing down out of his head, it flows upward, signifying his final resting place and giving it an ethereal quality that you can't look away from. Even for being a movie released in 2001, the visual effects of this film stand out against anything else of the era. Santi not only seems to forever be trapped in his watery grave no matter where he ventures to, his body has also become translucent. You can see his skeleton showing through as he walks down the hallways or reaches out to touch another one of the boys. It's a mastery of visual effects that looks like it could easily have been put together last week. For comparison, The Lord of the Rings Fellowship of the Ring came out the same year and moved CGI effects forward by leaps and bounds. The Devil's Backbone was made for only 5% of the budget of The Fellowship of the Ring. The fact that it still holds up today is amazing. 
Some of the best scenes in the film include the night that Carlos sees Santi for the first time. While sneaking out of his room with a fellow orphan, he gets left behind and has to hide as Jacinto enters the kitchen. He hears Santi, and when he goes down to the cellar to investigate, he comes face to face with him. He runs to escape the kitchen and return to his room. Carlos thinks he's outrun the specter, only to find Santi appear at the end of a long hallway. As he walks towards Carlos, we are shown the character in full form in the moonlight. It is both beautiful and terrifying to see. When the heads of the orphanage finally confront Jacinto, we see what he really is and get some great back and forth between him, Carmen, and Dr. Cesares, played by frequent Del Toro collaborator Federico Lupi. When Jacinto gets fed up with all the games he's had to play to find the stashed gold bars, Carmen unloads on him with the silver-topped cane that she walks with. Jacinto grabs his mouth as blood trickles down. He thinks he's about to unleash his fury upon her when he finds a gun held on him by the doctor. A great scene to show the character's dedication to their own priorities. Jacinto to the gold, and the others to the safety of the children. Of course, the end of the film sticks out too, as the boys band together to fight off Jacinto. The rest of their guardians have died, and now it's up to them to bring Jacinto to the spirit of Santi as he has requested. When they all reach the cellar, Jacinto thinks he has the upper hand and levels his shotgun to the boys, who are armed only with sharpened sticks. Out of nowhere, one of the boys stabs him under his raised arm in the armpit. Del Toro admitted that this was done on purpose to provide an uncomfortable grimace to the audience. The wound looks very real and very painful. Then Jacinto is beaten down and stabbed a few more times. The result is unsettling and convincing. Bravo to the special effects team that made these injuries look real. Jacinto is finally reunited with Santi as the spirit can finally get the revenge it has been after since he died. While The Devil's Backbone wasn't his first film, it pushed Del Toro to show that he was a filmmaker that could accomplish a lot with very little. He considers it his first film. Kronos didn't turn out as well as he had hoped, Mimic was a disaster, but The Devil's Backbone was able to give him the satisfaction he wanted from a film that he had created. The film ended up with an unfortunate release date. It had its first screening at a film festival in Toronto on September 10th, 2001. Del Toro says that when September 11th happened, he wondered if it was a good time to release such a film that dealt with war and death. In the end, he decided it might not be commercially responsible to release the film, but it would be morally responsible to. It showed that while dealing with war and death was hard, there was life when you reached the other side of it. The boys see everything around them fall apart, but at the end of the film, they travel off to start their lives in this brand new world. Despite the global chaos at the time, the film went on to play festivals across the world. It even won some awards during this run. It would take the grand prize at the Amsterdam Fantastic Film Festival in 2002, and it really cleaned up at the Gerardermer Film Festival, taking home the International Critics Award, Special Jury Prize, and Youth Jury Grand Prize. Elsewhere, it took home the coveted Popcorn Award at the Latin America MTV Movie Awards, and the lead actor, Fernando Tiev, even got a Young Artist Award for Best Young Actor in an International Film. While the film only received a small release in the US, it got a huge box office return in other markets. Even with its limited run in the US, it still garnered quite a following when it hit video stores. Remember Bravo's 100 Scariest Movie Moments? Well, the scene of Sante creepily haunting the hallway of the orphanage made it to number 61 on that list. Then there's popular horror movie site Bloody Disgusting, which ranked it at number 18 in its top 20 horror films of the decade. They called the film elegant and deeply felt. It's alternatively a gut-wrenching portrait of childhood in the time of war and a skin-crawling evocative nightmare. The love for the film pushed Del Toro to once again try to move forward with his films into more of a mainstream capacity. Mimic had scared him, but he tried again when offered Blade 2. He says that experience was the complete opposite of what he had on Mimic. It was then that he knew he could comfortably move forward into mainstream filmmaking. He could work within a studio system, but also never lose his love for making his own stories. In 2006, he made the film Pan's Labyrinth, which he considers a sister film to The Devil's Backbone. It follows a girl who was also dealing with the Spanish Civil War as she discovers a secret magical world that is beckoning her to join it. Del Toro considers the two films to have a kind of rhyme together. He does play coy about in what ways, as he wants the viewers to discover those things on their own, but says if you can play them back to back, you can see Pan as the next verse in the song that The Devil's Backbone is singing. Del Toro has continued to make imaginative films that capture the audience's imagination and transports them to strange new worlds. His film The Shape of Water won four Oscars, including Best Director for Del Toro, and one for Best Picture. Del Toro has proven himself one of our best storytellers, and from the looks of it, he has plenty of stories left to tell. While Del Toro has moved on to bigger things in Hollywood, he's always remembered for his horror roots. 
The Devil's Backbone showcases his impeccable monster and world building, while also setting up his love for the setting dictating the story. Hopefully we will see Del Toro fully return to the genre soon. 